Shall I begin? Hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, allow me to warmly welcome you to today's seminar session. Uh, the first of the series called Curriculum Studies in Canada. My name is Ying Ma, UBC Postdoctorate Fellow and um, Coordinator for this seminar series. I feel very honored and humbled to chair today's meeting. Each session will be approximately one hour with the speakers allotted around 40 minutes to give their presentations, followed by a short Q&A segment. Uh, with the permission of the speakers, we will be uh, uh, recording each session and they will become available on both of our website, Quickum Studies in Canada.ca and the YouTube channel. And Kira will now introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nicholas Anifuk. Uh, welcome. Beautiful. Thank you, Anita. And Thank good you. morning, good afternoon, I suppose, all depending where we are. It is my privilege to introduce a dear mentor and friend, Dr. Nicholas Singafuk, this afternoon. Nicholas is a full professor and vice dean of graduate studies in the Faculty of Education at the University of Ottawa. He is the co-director of the Ontario Equity Knowledge Network and a past president of CSSE. In 2018, he was awarded the Ted T. Aoki Award for distinguished service within the field of Canadian curriculum studies which recognizes scholars who have made significant contributions to research, teaching, and professional service in curriculum studies in Canada. Most recently, Nicholas can be found recording and editing his Folk and Conversation podcast, dedicated to talking about the academic -y stuff that informs our lived experiences. For myself, Nick's podcast is a perfect example of his commitment to curriculum studies, not simply as a field of scholarship, but as a way of life. One who continuously breathes life back into the pursuit of study, the art of conversation, and our innate curiosity to ask deeper questions about our world. His podcast has brought curriculum theorists into conversation with one another and into conversation with the public at a time where so many of us have felt isolated during this global pandemic. It was because of Nick's podcast that I was able to share my research with family back home in Ontario and having listened to my conversation with Nick, my mom told me, I think I get it now. In addition to all of these titles and the many hats that he wears, Nicholas is a dedicated father, husband to Laurieanne, and friend to many. He gave me permission today to introduce him as I know him, and I won't go quite so far as that, but it is an honor to introduce the mentor who has given and gifted so much in my life. The focus of Nick's talk today is entitled Reconstructing Canadian Curriculum Studies, Life Writing, Settler Colonialism, and Reconciliation. In his presentation, he will retrace, sorry, he will retrace his journey in becoming a curriculum theorist with particular attention to narrative threads of his lived experience in order to reactivate and signify the significance of settler colonialism and reconciliation in Canadian curriculum studies. As we engage with this conversation today, I invite us to consider the presence and or the erasure of Indigenous peoples of whose territories we are on today, as Nicholas has encouraged us to do many times before. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Rungafuk. Sorry, it's me. I was on mute, so I was just thanking you so much, Ying, and and Kira Thank for such much. a generous welcome and introduction to what I'm calling the Zoomosphere. Um, and I'm here in my office on the, as an uninvited guest on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Algonquin people. And uh, our family continues, as I'll discuss later, to um, be the beneficiary of the privileges uh, uh, that have been incurred over time due to settler colonialism. Um, so I, you know, the, the, the essay today that I'm working on, I, just a brief overview of the premise. Uh, it's interesting, a year ago when I had submitted that uh, proposal to Bill and Anne about uh, this uh, really uh, crucial and important seminar series of uh, thinking through of what I would be doing. And then now, 
during a pandemic, trying to make it work in relation to what you had proposed. But I, I, I've been thinking about it, and uh, um, the the piece is is really informed, and I, I'll I'll start reading it in a second. But the piece is really informed by. 12 narrative snapshots that I'm putting together. In many ways, the 12 narrative snapshots are an attempt to kind of look at or mimic the, the, the you know, the poesis, if you will, in terms of uh, Sam Roach's book, uh, Syllabus's Curriculum, and thinking about uh, the 12 weeks that one would take up with students as part of a course. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to limit the essay and give myself structure in terms of doing 12 narrative snapshots, I think five or six of which I'll, I'll read today. And uh, each one, I'm t again, to give limits, if we're thinking, especially in terms of, of you're doing your coursework and thinking later on about writing up an essay, is trying to keep them to 500 words each as best as possible. And so if you have tw 12 narrative snapshots, 500 words, that's 6,000 words. So very pragmatic in that kind of sense of trying to give yourself a limit like that. So let me, let me, let me start. Um, so I'm calling this uh, narrative snapshot one running a course, and please yell at me if you can't hear me or if I'm reading too fast. Running, struggling while running to find a place, one's place as an uninvited guest along the shores of the Kitchissippi River on the unceded and unsurrendered traditional territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg first people. Pacing to find one's breath, a rhythm, a coursing, a timing that momentarily forgets my body struggling while moving migrating, meditating about writing, researching, and teaching, running along a gravel path, running as meditation, meditation as running, running and meditation together as a praxis of curriculum theorizing. Pausing from a world on fire, curriculum theorizing while meditating and running, running to the past and back again to this present moment towards some unknown future horizon. I am running a course, a coursing through time and space as recursive and iterative images come together as a confluence of turbulent temporal movements, reactivating, reconstructing, juxtaposing, and restoring, restoring a subject, subjected, at least for this presentation today, to life writing, settler colonialism, and reconciliation. I must have written this paper several times now, rewritten this paper several times now while running along the Ottawa River, a major historical artery for trade relations here in what some of us call Canada. And where we were living at the time of Bill and Anne's conceptualizations of curriculum studies in Canada, intellectual histories, present circumstances and future prospects is quite different from the current context of living curriculum, carere, in relation to a global pandemic and its civic unrest. So how might we start a story about reconstructing Canadian curriculum studies in relation to life writing, settler colonialism, truth and reconciliation? And why these curricular concepts and not others? What I outlined in my initial proposal for this seminar was that I would seek to retrace the intellectual studies that has shaped becoming a curriculum theorist, or as Dwayne Donald suggests elsewhere, a student of curriculum studies. To do so today, I draw on life writing research to reactivate and reconstruct the international, national, and provincial curriculum studies scholarship, which has shaped the situated particularities of the current moment of curriculum theorizing. More specifically, I retrace the intellectual works that grad students and I address in a course called EDU 6102 Curriculum Studies Seminar. In that course, we're called upon to attend to a critical examination of research within the field of curriculum studies. In many ways, I invite grad students in such courses to reactivate, reconstruct, learn and unlearn their conceptions of what might constitute Canadian curriculum studies in relation to Aoki's concepts of the curriculum as planned, implemented and lived. Over the course of the term and during our intellectual running, we draw on Carreri, life writing research, to analyze and synthesize the juxtaposition of different narrative snapshots that seek, without promise, to reactivate the absent presence of settler colonialism, truth, and reconciliation toward reconstructing our understandings of Canadian curriculum studies, and perhaps even ourselves. 
in what follows then, I share a series of what I'm calling narrative snapshots that draw on such concepts. In, attempt, in an attempt to address the following questions, I continue to ask with students, what is the isness of Canadian curriculum studies? What are our relations to such isness? And what am I, and what I'm asking here is not for the busyness, i uh, sorry, and what I'm asking here is not for the business or the busyness of understanding curriculum in the making, but rather for the making of our understandings of curriculum. Students often chuckle or whisper to each other, is he really serious? Usually we begin to address such curriculum inquiries through the life writing scholarship of Cynthia Chambers. And I continue to invite students to re reconsider her four foundational questions in relation to the curriculum as planned, implemented and lived. How are we experimenting with tools from different Canadian intellectual traditions and incorporating them into our theorizing? What kinds of languages and interpretive tools have we created to study what we know and where we want to go? In what ways have and are curriculum theorists writing in a detailed way the topos, the particular places and regions where we live and work? And how are these places inscribed in our theorizing as either presence or absence, whether we want them there or not? As Dylan reminds us, the kinds of questions that have been asked of the isness of the very concept of curriculum have not changed that much within our field of study or the making of curriculum that takes place at universities or within schools. And yet for several students, it's the first invitation to experiment with life writing research methodologies like Carreri as they labor to reactivate and reconstruct their understanding of Canadian curriculum studies. Together, we might even trouble the very concept of quote unquote Canadian intellectual traditions when attempting to reconstruct our field in terms of truth and reconciliation. So that's the end of uh, snap, narrative snapshot one. So narrative snapshot two, tentatively titled Life Writing Research as Carreri. The undertones of my teachings, empirical research and curriculum theorizing continue to be informed by Bill Pinar's concepts of Carreri, regression, progression, analysis, and synthesis. For some time now, Bill has revisited these concepts of, uh, revisited the concepts of allegory, juxtaposition, reactivation, and reconstruction across his different works. What I would call intellectual pieces of art of moving and juxtaposing historical and contemporary images as narrative montages. In the third edition of What is Curriculum Theory, for example, Bill explains, through allegory, one narrates a specific story that hints at a moment, at a more general significance. Its characters are at once particular and symbolic, simultaneously historical and transcendent, even mytho 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 mythological or spiritual. Understanding curriculum allegorically, self-consciously incorporates the past into the present, threaded through one's subjectivity. In speaking allegorically, we are not merely exchanging information, when we speak allegorically, we do not do so for the sake of a future in which such information will, we imagine, become usable. Rather, we self-reflexively articulate what is at hand, reactivating the past so as to render the present, including ourselves, intelli intelligible in conversation with others." End quote. Curriculum, as Carreri emphasizes, then as he makes clear, temporal distinctions to encourage the preservation of the present through its reactivation. We can see Bill leaning on these interpretive tools toward analyzing and synthesizing different historical and contemporary societal contexts such as, but not limited to, the racialized and gendered violence of lynching in the American South, no child left behind, race to the top, the nightmare that is the present, the Weimar Republic, Harlem Renaissance, or the cultural and psychic self-dissolution of our subjectivity into an enmeshment with the distractions on our iPhones and digital screens. Distraction demands, as he stresses, self-dissolution where one runs fast to, to remain in place, updating to stay the same. Indeed, in moving images of eternity, George Grant's critique of time, teaching, and technology, Bill reactivates the philosophical works of George Grant and draws our attention to his intellectual works as a philosopher, a teacher, 
toward offering a reconstruction, a reconstruction of how we might restore ourselves in relation to Canadian curriculum studies. Even so, he tells us, listening to Grant teach through studying the text he composed, his conversation with quote unquote great thinkers and with those in his myths summons his subjective presence requiring reactivation of the past that inhabits us, providing an opportunity for subjective reconstruction, perhaps even a, a porthole to transcendence. Grant, like we, like we students of curriculum, struggled to decipher the meaning of what this is that we are. Like Bill, I stress to students, to readers, to you listening today, that reactivation is a prerequisite toward reconstructing Canadian curriculum studies and ourselves in relation to unlearning settler colonialism as truth and perhaps as reconciliation. It is part of what Bill calls a reformulation of the regressive phase of Carreri, a method of studying one's lived experience of curriculum that encourages not only the remembrance of things past from points of view in the present, but also a re-experiencing of their immediacy there, a temporal regression in the educational service of reconstructing one's subjective experience of the present. Whereas reconstruction for Bill is a reformulation of the analytical phase of the method career, wherein one attempts to learn from what reactivation of the past has disclosed, incorporating the knowledge revelation presents, uh, knowledge revelation presents into a reconstructed understanding of who one was made to be, of what is at stake in the present moment, understanding that is now informed experientially and intellectually. So for this sem seminar presentation, this moment of curriculum theorizing, I am leading on a method of Carreri and Bill's concepts of reactivation and reconstruction to analyze and synthesize podcasting as uh, podcasting a curriculum as planned, implemented and lived within a seminar course on curriculum research. So that's the end of snapshot two. I'm going to snapshot three. And uh, it's called reactivating dominions toward making an end. So I'm starting here with a quote um, from Duncan Campbell Scott. But any forecast of Indian civilization, which looks for final results in one generation or two is doomed to disappoint. Final results may be attained, say, in four centuries by merging, by the merging of the Indian race with the whites and all these four things, treaties, teachers, missionaries, and traders with whatever benefits or injuries they bring in their train, aid in the making an end." End quote. So how might we reactivate the past via life writing research toward a reconstructed understanding of who one was made to be? Our family now lives on the shores of the Kitchissippi River, a few kilometers downstream from our settler colonial Canadian parliament. Prior to living in Ottawa, my family immigrated to Canada from British Guyana and Glasgow, Scotland to Capscasing, a small rural, log uh, a small rural logging town in Northern Ontario. As a first generation settler immigrant, I attended the franco ontarian Catholic school system while learning to become a quote unquote good bilingual settler Canadian citizen. And yet learning about and with the First Nations communities whose territories we settled on, on Treaty 9, was not part of our family or school curriculum. Such citizenship education was certainly not part of the social studies or history curriculum. Indeed, during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, the public school curriculum ensured that we would learn to forget while settling and becoming Canadian citizens in that place at that time and ensured that we might too learn to profiteer from certain settler colonial treaty benefits. Our family was able to purchase land, secure mortgage, pay property tax, and generate economic equity over time due to, among other things, the Indian, uh, and, Lands, uh, the, the Indian and Lands Dominion Act, the Reserve System, Numbered Treaties, and the Indian, the Indian Residential Schooling System. In turn, such intergenerational settler colonial economic equity and inequity, their respective financial literacies supported our university education as first generation immigrants, which later translated into a professorship of curriculum theory at the University of Ottawa, with an annual income exceeding an annuity of four to $5 a year, buying land, 
sending our three boys to public school and building, inter and building once again intergenerational equity over time. And yet again, the school curriculum still teaches us to forget old stock and for, uh, to forget how old stock and first generation Canadians like myself and our family become such benevolent beneficiaries who continue to profit from settler futurities. In 1906, Duncan Campbell Scott published an account in Scribner's Magazine of his canoe travels north as part of a commission to negotiate the parameters of Treaty 9 with different Cree and Ojibwe nations. In it, he wrote, and I quote, the territory contains much arable land, many million feet of pulpwood, untold wealth of minerals, and unharnessed water power sufficient to do the work of half the continent. Through the map of this unregarded region, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, Premier of Canada, had drawn a long line sweeping up from Quebec and curving down upon Winnipeg, marking the course of the eastern section of the new transcontinental railway." End quote. Here I am attempting to reactivate the past in relation to my present economic equity and the future guarantees that came with the making of a nation called Canada for some set citizens and an acknowledgement by Duncan himself of a making of an end for First Nations, Métis and Inuit families and their communities. To do so at that time, Duncan Campbell Scott acknowledged the symbolic and psychological violent ab absent presence of the Dominion police force. And I quote here, I am bound to say the police force outshone the members of the commission itself in the observance of the Indians the glory of their uniforms and the wholesome fear of the white man's law, which they inspired spread down the river in advance and reached James Bay before the commission. Policing was used to ensure the settler colonial parameters in negotiating Treaty 9. Policing continues to be used today against indigenous communities seeking to protect what was promised by former and present settler colonial governments and its citizens. Moreover, in our historical and moral justifications, all we are left with is a settler politician and poet's written interpretations of what Chief Misabe and others shared during their Treaty 9 negotiations. And I quote, yes, said Misabe, we know now that you are good men sent by our great father, the king, to bring us help and strength in our weakness. All that we have comes from the white man and we are willing to join with you and make promises which will last as the air above the water, as long as our children remain who come after us. Such settler colonial benevolent and paternalistic interpretations continue to persist in our public schooling history curriculum and its respective textbooks here in Canada. They persist in government policies directed at First Nation, Métis and Inuit communities. It persists for several Canadian citizens as the case of Senator Bayak illustrates in our historical public settler consciousness. How might we read such historical accounts in ways that seek to reactivate, reconstruct, and restore the ways that address the fetishization of such settler colonial benevolence in relation to how each of us has and continues to benefit from such past broken promises? How might we as a family live in relation to the Algonquin people who have yet to surrender their lands via any treaties? What are our responsibilities toward a different kind of futurity? That's the end of uh, snapshot three. So snapshot four is uh, tentatively titled Studying a Curriculum Theory Project. 20 years ago, Bill invited me to join an amazing group of curriculum scholars at Louisiana State University uh, at their uh, curriculum theory project. Uh, Bill, for example, Bill Dahl, Den Denise J. Cuny, Claudia Eppert, Patron Monroe Henry, and others, and an amazing group of, of grad students that I was lucky to be part of at that time. Um, at that time, like uh, I, like many of the grad students who now take the Introduction to Curriculum Studies course, were studying what constituted an international field of curriculum studies in terms of its histories and its discursive regimes. We analyze and synthesize its different situated particularities in relation to our curriculum uh, as lived. Two of my first uh, research assistantships were to copy edit the International Handbook of Curriculum Research, as well as a curriculum in a new key. At that time, post 9-11, I struggled to understand the different dimensions of studying, curriculum theorizing, 
reading different intellectual works on existentialism, phenomenology, post-structuralism, educational philosophy, indigenous ways of knowing, life writing research methodologies, feminist and queer theory, internationalization, and so on and so on. And all the while not knowing, not necessarily understanding the relations among what I was studying in terms of who I was, am, and could be as a curriculum scholar, or even for that matter, a human being. During the devastating and traumatic events of 9-11, in a course with Bill, we read The Gender of Racial Politics and Violence in America. For me, it was my first formal introduction within the context of schooling to the historical and contemporary confluences of gender, race, and sexuality, to the images of black bodies hanging from magnolia trees. It was a reactivation, a reconstruction for how I began to unlearn and learn to look back at Canada as a settler colonial democracy in terms of its historical harms and contemporary issues. In its opening pages, drawing on Claudia Eppert's work on testimony, Bill reminds us, what is melancholic for me, or should I say what leaves me in mourning, is to live among and teach white people who remember nothing who perceive racisms as merely attitudinal and as a common among black folks as among white and most surprisingly have nothing to do with them. Such, such knowledge, he continues, may be traumatizing, threatening to shatter the na narcissistic unity of the subject, decentering and displacing it as ego. Such calls for reactivating and reconstructing the unity of settler colonial violence is, as Bill stressed then, curriculum as carere, an excavation of the lived, including historical relations among self, society, and subject matter. This labor of excavation is made, is made, as he warned then, difficult by the various defenses in place against it. Such defenses or Socratic apologies in the name of settler colonialism and the name of neoliberal forms of democracy are embedded in the very material and psychosocial bedrock of a Canadian society. Although I had several different intellectual opportunities to study the violent segregation and killing of black mothers, fathers, and children, such intellectual reactivations did not necessarily translate toward reconstructing my curriculum as lived in relation to anti-black racism outside the gates of Louisiana State University. Such interior segregation, the present absence of the racial politics and violence in Canada, continues to haunt my work as a scholar and university administrator today. Perhaps what has been hopeful these past few years is to see different school administrators, teachers, and colleagues committed toward addressing the ongoing intergenerational violence of a settler colonialism and unlearning its syllabus as curriculum. And yet I remain mired in frustration, even disheartened with the government, uh, institutional policies, personal politics and respective public historical consciousness that continue to offer deferred promises as incremental equity. We Canadian settlers are indeed the marrow thieves. That's uh, the end of narrative snapshot uh five uh sorry four i'm going to read one more and then i'll just explain what the the rest of the paper is and then and then i really would just like an opportunity to have a conversation about the different works that are different snapshots that are going to be part of this um this one's tentatively uh changing courses in response to COVID 19. um as i stated earlier when i first accepted to take on this seminar presentation things were much different at the time I was planning to teach during the 2020 spring summer session, which started in May and ended mid July. I hope to spend the rest of July and August taking summer pre with family and focus on writing up this essay for today. I also plan to take a much needed sabbatical that was supposed to start this coming January. Because I was scheduled to take a sabbatical, I thought it would be in my best interest to teach those two courses during the 2020 spring summer sessions and then not teach again until the following September. One of those courses was the EDU 5160, 5260 uh, Introduction to Curriculum Studies, uh, which I've taught online asynchronously on several occasions. 
The other was EDU 6102, a seminar in curriculum research, uh, which I originally planned to offer as a face-to-face -face course. Uh, at that time, it was unclear to me and perhaps others what the implications of a global pandemic might have for us here in the Ottawa region, let alone the rest of Canada. I remember driving in our mini black minivan as a family to Mount Sutton for our March break ski trip. Just as we crossed the Quebec provincial border, we received a phone call at the hill, that the hill was closed for the foreseeable future. Like others, we scrambled to cancel our accommodations and travel plans. Shortly after, different federal, provincial and municipal politicians quickly called on us to self-isolate and to physically distance from one another. Like others, we witnessed the exponential spread of COVID-19 first across Quebec, BC, then Ontario, and the rest of Canada. For the first two weeks, we spent our days trying to support each other as a family and maintaining some sort of routine. That routine included creating an environment for the kids to do their schoolwork at a distance with their teachers. For some university professors like myself, we were also asked to pivot and teach our courses online via Brightspace. At that time, I was teaching a synthesis course and a special topics course we called Writing Toward Publication. The synthesis course is the last course that our MED students take where they're asked to synthesize the different uh, theoretical or works or research that they've taken up in their courses and then uh, um, uh, try to make sense of that synthesis either in relation to their professional practice or an area of interest that they'd like to take up. For me, my biggest pedagogical concern was to support each student's overall mental health and well-being. Being at home in fear of the unknown was and is mentally and emotionally difficult. It soon became clear that we would be remaining in self-isolation, teaching and learning at a virtual distance for the foreseeable future. At home with our family, I found myself becoming more and more frustrated, impatient, and even angry jumping uh, from Teams to Teams meeting, zooming in and out, creating online course content, and starting up a podcast called Fook and Conversation that would later be incorporated into the curriculum as planned, implemented, and lived for EDU 6102. Perhaps my biggest frustration of working from home was the daily competition with my sons who were gaming for the limited internet bandwidth that connects our home to the virtual outside world. And yet we were enormously privileged in terms of the lifestyle, the economic equity that our family has been afforded through my work at a university, that I can be paid to study, research, and teach from home. On April 17th, Lori Ann decided to take the boys to Wasega Beach to finish their school year at a distance and to be closer to her family. Once there, she and the boys self-isolated for two weeks and then slowly integrated with her parents. One of the main reasons Lorianne decided to take the boys to Wasega was because there was no access to high-speed internet and hence limited access for the boys to plug into the digital gaming industry. Instead, the boys would go once or twice a day via their grandparents' Bell Digital Hub to check in with their teachers and submit assignments. I took advantage of the next 52 days to study and research the intellectual works of different Canadian scholars, except for those of Han Yu Wang and Bill Pinar, to produce the Fook and Conversation podcast and attended, of course, syllabus as a podcasting curriculum or what we might call curriculum as podcasting. So I, I, that's the first five. And then the sixth uh, snapshot is me setting up um, a description of how the podcasts have come to be. And so Really, you know, I didn't really have a clue in terms of, well, how does one podcast? How does one put a podcast together? Let alone, how do you try to incorporate a podcast into a course? And so let's just say there could have been a lot of running at that time to try to think through how one puts together a syllabus as curriculum. Uh, and I'm thinking here, of, of course, of Sam Roca's uh, book, which is so timely and, uh, and, and so interrelated in terms of what I'm trying to do in this, in this, in this essay. And uh, what, became, what became apparent in terms of the premise was 12 weeks. So I have 12 weeks, 12 different uh, scholars that I would like to, to invite. Um, I asked them to share two or three uh, of their works in which I would, I would read beforehand if I hadn't read them already or reread them. 
And then uh, at a certain date in the future, they would join me for uh, the podcast, Fukin Conversation podcast, where really the premise of the podcast was to ask them or for me to try to think of questions about their work um, that could provide an opportunity for them to engage in a conversation of, of thinking through their concepts into the current context of COVID-19. And so that, that next snapshot sets that up. And then I'm left with six uh, snapshots, each of which I will deal with two of the scholars uh, podcasts and link that to the course. And then in relation to how I've laid out earlier, the concepts of uh, reactivation and reconstruction in terms of, of Bill's work. So in many ways, it's trying in reconstructing Canadian curriculum studies, which this is <clears throat> really situated in terms of reconstructing, at least for me, a sense of Canadian curriculum studies that I would present to grad students as part of a course that embeds the podcasting within it and trying to juxtapose the, those different narratives in relation to the framing through Bill's uh, method of Carreri and those key, those core concepts and then reading through the different, uh, so, you know, if you're not familiar with who is, who's, who's coming up in those snapshots, it's, it's Dwayne Donald's work is what we started off with week one, uh, Lindsey Gibson, which was so timely and important. He recently joined you all at UBC and um, probably one of the, the, the most well-read uh, social studies uh, teachers and his, and, and um, uh, the word I'm looking for, um, so knowledgeable about uh, history in Canada and, and its implications. And really that conversation for him at the time talking about uh, the comparison between the 1918-1920 pandemic and uh, what we might learn from that and the implications. So that was very timely in that uh, second week, uh, which was May, May 11th. And then uh, Han Yu Wang, uh, and reaching out to her in, ter in terms of nonviolence education and how she was thinking about that and how we could think of her work in relation to COVID-19 and really the, the, the sentiment at that time in terms of the anti-Chinese racism or the discourse in the US in terms of China and, and, and calling it the China virus and what, how is uh, Han Yu thinking about that? Um, but she, you know, and she leans on the work of, the works of, uh, of uh, uh, she works, uh, let me see, now I've got another mental block, but she works uh, on, on the, the psychoanalytical works of uh, Carl Jung, there we go, uh, and, uh, and her, her, the ways in which she's thinking of Carl Jung's work, uh, so Eastern and Western philosophy, and, 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 and bringing those two things together in terms of confluence, and then thinking about the implications of bringing those conversations together in our understanding of COVID-19. Uh, Vidya Shah, who's uh, newly hired at uh, York University and uh, her, a lot of her work is in relation to uh, addressing uh, the questioning of our own privileges, regardless of where we come from or who we are in terms of leadership. And, and once we reach positions of leadership, how do we continue to question that, which is very much linked to Han Yu Wang's Carl Jung's work about shadow, shadow work. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 the next person after that was Aparna Mishra Tark and really her work with, and looking at uh, Coetzee's work and the figure of the teacher uh, in relation to post-colonial context and how, how we might reread our conceptions of the figure of the teacher uh, in, in terms of that kind of work. So I, I try to balance uh, the, the, those that I, inter that, that I, invited with, for example, scholars that I knew, and then scholars I knew at a distance that I hadn't really read their work, because I really think it's important as we try to reconstruct what might constitute Canadian curriculum studies to really pay attention to different voices that might, <clears throat> might not necessarily, might still be at the periphery of certain conversations. Uh, Catherine Van Kessel, for example, her work on uh, terror management theory, which was really timely at the time uh, in June when we had that conversation and uh, how, how might we understand terror management theory in relation to fear and COVID-19, but also in terms of the protests against anti-Black racism. Um, and that transitioned into uh, Jennifer Tupper's work, uh, 
where uh, she looks at and we discuss uh, settler life writing and troubling settler historical consciousness and and resonates very much in what I, I tried to kind of do in in the one snapshot about how we are, you know, how do we reconsider Treaty 9, for example, or why was Treaty 9 not even part of my, my historical consciousness as a child and only until more recently reading the works, uh, you know, an essay by Duncan Campbell Scott. Um, and so, and then there's Ted Christou and uh, Tim Stanley in terms of looking at the different concepts of race, racialization or racisms, anti-racisms. And um, I think what was important, and I'll just finish up two things, what was important at the end of the course was Rita Irwin's work it was so timely and important because that same week students were writing up their final essays and really in, in what her work with her students represents is different uh, aesthetic forms of trying to represent uh, our curriculum theorizing and the course and the interconnections amongst one's subjectivity, their bodies and doing and the work and the ways in which they might rep represent different renderings of of their their intellectual experimentations so it was very timely in terms of students being able to to look at that that work because in many ways asking them or to think about curriculum theorizing as a form of art um, as a form of doing uh, and uh and and also we we when we think about re, uh, reconstructing Canadian curriculum uh, studies and thinking about different futurities, it was so timely important. And, and again, it's not like this was planned or I knew, but inviting Kira to share her work and the work that she's working on. And really from a Haudenosaunee perspective in relation to her place and time of rethinking curriculum theory, her curriculum theorizing in terms of her own work and, and her own intersubjectivity, but also not that she's promising this, but when I read her work and take it up with students, uh, thinking differently about what might be potential uh, in terms of our renderings of uh, reconstructing curriculum studies, Canadian curriculum studies toward the future. And so, um, and then returning to Bill's work and asking him uh, about uh, uh, his more recent publications, his thoughts on what was taking place in the United States at the time and, and also across Canada. And, um, and hence the first part of the essay is to really situate uh, Bill's concepts that we visit at the end of the course and how those have informed my working through the different uh, snapshots and those interconnections. Um, the podcast continues today and uh, the last person I interviewed was uh, Adrian Downey and uh, I was fortunate enough to be his external uh, examiner for his PhD thesis and I just think his work as well as timely in terms of thinking about death uh, uh, as curriculum or curriculum as death and uh, what are the implications for us uh, during this time of COVID-19. So I'm just going to stop there because it's 1.43 and I want to leave enough time to ask questions. Thank you very much Dr. Nicholas Anifuk for your one, wonderful speech with a lot of very powerful insights and um, now there are a few minutes left for any comments or questions. So you can unmute yourself and um, make your comments or any questions for Professor um, Nicholas Ennefog. It could be anything. You can. I'm right. having soup for lunch today. <laughs> question go ahead yeah i'm just i'm really curious about this whole uh podcasting sort of methodology as sort of a pedagogy to reach out to i think maybe perhaps a wider audience this is one of the things i'm, I'm really conscious of as sort of uh somebody who's just sort of entering the academy is how do we make our work uh, more accessible to a wider audience and especially as like educational researchers how do we make our work more pragmatic for the everyday teacher and for the everyday student. And is this as a podcast or are there other uh, pedagogies out there that you would recommend that we consider as we enter our academic careers? Yeah. Well, I think that that's such a, it's such a great question that, uh, I mean, you, you outlined audience, right? And so 
for the podcast, what was helpful in terms of, of thinking it through was the audience for the podcast as, as it started was for grad students in the course. And um, one of the, you know, one of the recurring questions that I get from grad students, whether it's in uh, introduction to curriculum studies or that course is, what does curriculum theorizing have to do with action? And I, I always have to return to say that curriculum theorizing is action. It is a doing. It is a, it is bracketing of a moment in time for you to think through works in relation to your own, uh, at least for me, that's, you know, I, I read, whether I read Kira's stuff, Bill's stuff, Anne's stuff, Rita's stuff, I, I, you know, if I go for a run, I'm thinking about it and, and sometimes like the implications it has for my everyday life as a teacher or as a father, um, that connection of study for me, um, you know, are so resistant perhaps as a teenager and even a young uh, man to this premise of, of how academic study uh, can change one's uh, sense of, of self, even though outside of, of say school or university, you're reading so many different things, whether it's popular culture that, that works to form you in different, in different ways. So that would, you know, that, that, that it's having, knowing that question, the recurring question from students, what does this have to do with it? Was a response to that was to, to really think about when I was reading, um, you know, two or three of the, the interviewees uh, works was how to formulate questions in a way that afforded them opportunities to illustrate how their work is relevant to uh, us here in, in Canada as, as Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadian uh, citizens. And, and, and kind of balancing that too sometimes, and I always find the tension for me, even in writing this piece, is the balance because I love curriculum theorizing and I love getting into the theory and the, and the way it, it excites me and, and gets me to think. Uh, and, and thinking about readers in terms of doing that without any promise of usability, as as Bill is stressed in his work and others, like that the curriculum theorizing in itself should should be able to stand alone. But then, to me, the synthesis part, which sometimes is, and I see for several grad students that I teach, is the most difficult part. Is that translation of like, so what? Okay, so you've done this curriculum theorizing. So how do we reemerge into the present? to answer that question of so what so what does it mean for for each of us and i and even for me that's the most difficult uh difficult part is the is the so what and you know i started the piece by by running and in the first podcast it was timely in terms of interviewing Dwayne because Dwayne's work is always sought to address the concept of balance from a Cre uh pop Ch chase creep perspective and in that first podcast um, he talks about the concept of balance and, and what it calls on us to do. And so personally, like at that point in time, why I start the pieces running is I started running again and trying to, to, to create some sort of balance between work, uh, my family and taking care of oneself physically while also trying to collaborate with others to take care of our, ourselves. And um, um, that's the work I think in terms of the, the, the concept of the self dissolution, uh, not 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 just since the emergence of like say iPhones per se, but I would say self dissolution in terms of uh, becoming uh, like myself a really good consumer of whatever is out there. So that that was a very long winded answer, uh, or perspective. I wouldn't call it an answer, but yeah. So that uh, the, and and uh, so. I always, um, the podcast, you know, the idea was to do 12 and I continue to do them. We took a little break because I went to uh, be with my family in Wasega Beach and we didn't have access to high-speed internet there. But uh, since interviewed Adrian Downey, I'm interviewing Carrie Lynn Chichu on Friday and I hope to continue. And the, I feel outside of the course a little bit different. There's a little bit more freedom because it's also not bounded to a course and what I'm doing with students for the podcast. So it's, a time to have, uh, I don't know, I see it as having fun reading people's work and having a conversation about some of the concepts in their work and how they're thinking about those in relation to the current context.
Any comments or questions? Maybe I'll just quickly jump in, uh, Steve here. Hi, Steve. Uh, thank you, Nick, for your um, your seminar. And uh, this analogy of running through curriculum uh, and taking the, uh, a sense of self uh, mental well-being prior to uh, sifting through the past to understand the present um, and this uh, tension of curriculum theory into action and you mentioned uh, curriculum theorizing is actually doing and that analogy of when you're running you're doing as well um, i come from a background of physical and health education in terms of understanding what, what i'm trying to find is understanding the connection between curriculum theory as a global sense and then into more of a, a subject-based um, specialized area and making those connections and maybe you could uh, uh, address how, how to make those connections from curriculum theory down into more specific subject based mm -hmm. well i mean uh the example of of thinking through when we talk about truth and reconciliation, uh, the truth component, and we're being called upon as Canadian citizens to reactivate our relations with the past in a, in a different way um, that perhaps we haven't been called on to do before. Um, the school curriculum, for example, in Ontario, the social studies curriculum when it was revised in 2018, um, has eight references to truth and reconciliation throughout. So there's connections that, that teachers can make there, specifically in that one. Um, I have been approached by health and physical educators on specifically outdoor ed uh, programs and how they can partner with different First Nation communities to do that. Um, but I, I, it really, like, it was, so when I say curriculum theorizing, for me, it is uh, the intellectual engagement with that process of truth and reconciliation. Like, I mean, truth and reconciliation to me are... Uh, uh, something put forth by in by our, our federal government in partnership with different or organizations, but the the kind of unsettling um, uh, excavation that we're called upon to do uh, in relation to those different kind of histories. So the first thing is to try to go and find those those histories that you might not have had access to, and then to read them. At least for me. And then to think about, okay, well, what are the, the, what are the implications that these might have or not have in terms of my, my, daily, my daily practices, if you will, as a, as a teacher. So um, what I find often working with uh, teachers or school administrators in my curriculum studies course is that uh, when we're talking about curriculum, it's deferred to their context in terms of uh, teaching within a high school or elementary school. But I try to remind them, like, look at my course syllabus at my 12 weeks, because it is a curriculum, the 12 weeks, and I am trying to do something that might be a little bit different in terms of how the Ontario curriculum, per se, is laid out and how teachers might create units of study and lesson plans, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just to end on that note, like, I got uh, an email from my son's teacher last night, and um, I had to respond. Uh, and I don't, and I don't know if it was the right thing to do because I, I usually am pretty quiet and, and on that front, and I feel sometimes it's not, it's not fair. But if I can just find it for a second for you, it was, um, it, it was the teacher sent, dear parents, I need to prepare your child for tomorrow's social study lesson. Uh, please have a discussion with them in order to reflect on the following questions. One. Before your neighborhood was established, do you know what was there? Uh, what there was in its place? Was it farmland, an incorporated town, a factory? You can do a quick Google search. Why does your street have its name? Is it named after a famous person, a feature of the landscape of the area, or something else? Is there a link between the uh, to to toponymy of your community and its history? And my response was, in terms of the following question, was it farmland and an incorporated town, a factory? It really works to reproduce a settler historical consciousness in terms of social studies and non-Indigenous citizenship education. 
Not sure if you will be addressing whose unceded traditional territories Ottawa was built upon prior to becoming farmland townships and cities and how renaming places has worked to erase such indigenous histories and especially in light of Orange Shirt Day on the, the 30th. I think in the past I, don't, I wouldn't say anything and I, I'm just tired of my kids being asked each year to do the same thing. Um, I have three of them, they've gone through the same grades and it's pretty much a template where they're asked the same question year after year. And so I, I you know, I, I, I try to work with teachers to ask them how we might reconstruct the idea of what constitutes Canadian curriculum studies uh, in relation to social studies, as an example. So I think that's the, it's how, you know, and I think that might only happen uh, by going and taking the time, like, you know, I, I know for my master's thesis, I made it a point to just read uh, post-colonial and indigenous feminist scholarship. And then at LSU, we were, we were, we were, we were pushed to read uh, outside our own subjective experiences, the works of other, uh, other scholars. And that's one way I would suggest to try to do that, that might, without promise, translate into how you might think about um, taking up, you know, the provincial curriculum in, in different ways. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Gulzar here uh, from Pakistan. Um, actually, I want to uh, know a little bit more about uh, this uh, concept of curator or theorizing uh, the curriculum studies. Um, we in Pakistan, uh, you know, when we uh, teach our students here in schools and colleges, so here uh, there is this predominant perception that truth comes from the authority and the authority is the teacher uh, and the teacher cannot be questioned um, and, and once you question the teacher so that is called disobedience or that is somehow take this uh, you know anti-teacher or anti-education uh, uh, behavior from from the student side uh, and this is very much to do with, uh, you know, the colonial inheritance. Um, we have, we, we, we are a post-colonial state. We, we have post-colonial tendencies in our education. So I want to know that, uh, you know, what is, what is the, uh, the role of the teacher and the students uh, in terms of theorizing the curriculum uh, like, I don't know much about Canada, but here in Pakistan, we have uh, textbook boards. Pakistan is a federation in each uh, province. We have textbook boards and the textbook boards receives direction from uh, the Ministry of Education. Uh, and, and, and then they give proper text like you are talking about social studies. So in social studies, uh, there will be lessons and at the end of each lesson, there will be questions and questions will be answered from within that lesson. So there is no, you know, as you said, it is a form of doing. So uh, it's running or doing, you know, I'm talking about curator. So where is that uh, teacher's involvement? Uh, is that the same or it's different mm. uh, there in Canada? I would like to know more about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gilzar. I, I would say yes and no. That that uh, there is, I mean, we have provincial curriculum here and we have standardized tests in Ontario at different grade levels that teachers are limited in what they can do at those different grade levels if they're standardized tests in math or, or reading and writing. Um, we have a standardized curriculum with overall and specific expectations, but the ways in which um, the overall expectations are written in certain ways that they're, they're wide enough and open enough for you to reread them differently. And I think that's the key, like teacher education um, in many ways here, you know, in Canada, and, and, and we're working to do that is to work with teacher candidates to read curriculum differently, to, 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 to you know, be open to interpreting it, it, it in, in different kinds of ways. And, and depending on which province that you, you live in and the communities that you're you're part of, there might be pushback either from uh, parents or 
uh, or within the school culture itself. So uh, there's a little bit that that goes on, but I'm I like I said in the piece, I'm a little bit more hopeful. There, I've been lucky enough for the last two years to work with a group of principals that are called the Hard Conversations Group. There's about 60 of them, and all of those principals are are committed to questioning their own privilege uh, working in those schools and really trying to collaborate with the school the school community to change the culture around uh, you know what they're addressing across the curriculum so changing courses uh, the grade 11 course here in in uh, Ottawa is now in indigenous literature course and there's a commit a com a more of a commitment to addressing anti-black racism um, which we you know we certainly in both those areas haven't done enough and I'm not just talking about the schooling system I'm talking about the University of Ottawa and our own faculty of education too so this year uh, rereading our own curriculum uh, as a faculty of education in terms of the present absence of anti-black racism is, is a priority area for us this year as well. So th those, those different aspects. But I, I, what, I, what I try to caution students is to, to hold off is because where they get frustrated is trying to translate the theory all the time and what they're reading to how it's use value in terms of doing something in the future. And I'm like, why not just enjoy just bracketing the moment to kind of you engage and with some concepts to figure them out for yourself and, and make that part of the course. And then maybe a year from now, it'll have, it'll, it'll have some, some sort of relationship or it might inform what you're doing uh, at that point in time. And that, at least for me, has continues to be the case is that there's certain things 10 years ago, uh, as I said, that because of my lived experiences, the studies that I had done, I wasn't quite ready necessarily in terms of a synth synth synthetical moment to see you know, what kind of relationships I had with them. Whereas today, you know, if I think through it, some of the works that or concepts that, that I'm engaged with, they're more relevant at this present moment in time, and I'm 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 sure that uh, you know ten years from now uh, they'll be they'll be present, uh, and I'll relate the, to them in different ways. So it's a it's an iterative iterative pro province. I I don't know how to represent. I'm trying to figure out how to represent that in the essay. It's almost like it's either like the film Memento, where there's like the fragments where you're trying to put things together, where you'll, or it's like it's like a nest of it's like a nest of snapshots, like within one another that has like these, these, as Bill said, it's like a porthole of interconnections amongst these different snapshots. Yeah. The difficulty is trying to organize them into something legible that makes sense to other readers. That's the. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ennefuk. And uh, considering the time, so do you think uh, uh, you can take one more question? Or I, I have I, I've I've set aside till two two thirty. So I don't mm -hmm. you know people might stay like two thirty. Nick, come on. But if you have questions, mm -hmm. so any more questions? Maybe one more question. I see. Or can I have a question? Sure. Oh. Go ahead. Um, so um, you talk about reconciliation with a lot of your um, your teacher candidates and grad students, but I'm wondering how your international um, students react to reconciliation in Canada. Maybe they don't have a much um, background on uh, the history and society of Canada or like, is there, are there efforts um, to um, mimic um, reconciliation procedures in um, countries like Japan, China, Russia, where there's dominant cultures and, and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, so when we, when, when in the specific courses that I'm looking at, because we do have a course on the internationalization of curriculum studies. So, and that, because we have that course, that would be a course where I might take up those, that conversation. But, but you're absolutely right, because that becomes the, the dilemma of, when we're looking at the particularity of Canada itself, well, then what are the implications for international students? Um, so that, that is an important conversation that we have is, look, you know, I'm a first generation immigrant to Canada. 
um, that when I first came over was, you know, unknowingly became a resident and then eventually a citizen at such a young age without anyone ever telling me like this was the process that you become a citizen, even though schooling works to do that. Um, I would say the same, you know, the, 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 the context of, of reconciliation as a concept here is something that I struggle with because uh, on the one hand, I'm trying to honor uh, the requests of survivors that I've been able to work with and their commitment to reconciliation as a process. But on the other hand, having uh, a lot of critics of the reconciliation as a kind of Judeo-Christian concept um, that we're attempting to address. So whether you know it's reconciliation in South Africa or rec reconciliation here in Canada or elsewhere, um, we, I try to open and have have those conversations with them. But yeah, you you are right. So there is a, a little there there is in terms of the choice of readings to try to pre provide a, a little bit of context. Uh, around why it is that we're talking about reconciliation. And I took up reconciliation in the piece today, but that's not necessarily the primary focus of the course itself. Um, it's, it, it kind of more leans towards how do we examine the intergenerational impacts of uh, settler colonialism, of, what, of, uh, of which reconciliation specifically in Canada is one one incident, right? One event, one response to the intergenerational harms. And it's not to say that it's over. So we talk about kind of globally as the question you asked about how settler colonialism has worked across the globe in different, in different areas. So I, you know, international students can think about it for themselves as, as a Gulzar uh, commented in terms of Pakistan and or South Africa or thinking about it specifically in terms of Canada. We could also think about it in, in the United States as well. Uh, settler colonialism and how it's uh, and how it's uh, worked its way in, in the United States. Um, the, one of the things that I encourage international students uh, or first generation students uh, and trying to do that work myself is sometimes the response I get from some international students or first generation immigrant students like, well, that was not me. I just moved here. I didn't do any of that, that stuff. And and the, and the importance in why I'm illustrating Treaty 9 uh, for where I grew up is that uh, if we're committed to treaties as a form of relationship in, in, in the areas that treaties have been signed, then what are those implications? And in the areas like where I live, where they haven't been signed, what are, what are, the, what are the implications? Uh, yeah, so I have stories. I, 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 could, I have stories to share about that. I mean, one elder, uh, Peter DeConte, who's the fire, uh, sacred fire keeper, I remember taking my boys last year for my youngest loves to fish, took them for his birthday up to the basket hall to go fishing for two nights, three days, took them out of school. We, it was amazing. And then uh, I was speaking with the uh, elder DeConte about how we went fishing and, you know, he didn't say anything. And then he's, just, and we were there and he kind of just after we we're in the circle and he said, you know, um, why is it uh, other indigenous communities and Canadians, they don't ever come see us and ask us for permission to be on our territories. And, uh, and somebody asked like, what do you mean? And this is when they were building the new, uh, the new building in Ottawa and there was, there was different communities that were gonna have space, but no one consulted the Algonquin. But it also, in terms of the proper way for me to go fishing, because we drive right past uh, Kittigan Zeebee's reserve, because he mentioned to me over lunch, like Nick, you know, do you know that's where uh, our ancestors used to go and live and fish and hunt and bury our people before they flooded the reservoir. So I was fishing in a reservoir that's on top of his ancestors' uh, burials and uh, having that conversation with, while never acknowledging the history of that place. And so the importance of understanding the history of that place and the protocols as we travel across what might be one way of thinking about in our everyday experiences of addressing settler colonialism, how we can relate to elders like Peter de Conte and his community differently. And so now they have a, a huge campaign up there against the, the moose hunt because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in different individuals from Quebec are over, har over harvesting moose that are, that are in their area, traditional territories. Thank you very much, Dr. Nefuk and the wonderful conversations we have had today. 
And my thanks to Dr. Nicholas Anifuk again for his wonderful speech and the conversations, as well as Dr. William Pinar and Dr. Anthelen for hosting such an intellectually inspiring event. And I hope to thank every one of you for participating in today's session. Our next session is scheduled on September the 30th, uh, 2020, which is next Wednesday. So we are looking forward to seeing every one of you there. So have a very good day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Bill and Anne. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks, everyone. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Kira. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nicholas. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bill. Bye-bye, Anne. Bye-bye.